So the second speaker of this afternoon is Professor Elena nussenzweig Lopez from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. She is representing the host country. Professor Lopez obtained her PhD in 1991 from the University of Berkeley, working with Ron Perna and uh, later Craig Evans. After returning to Brazil, she worked for many years in the State University of Sao Paulo at Campinas and a few years ago moved to the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where she's still working. Professor Lopez is a highly regarded member of the Brazilian mathematical community, and her services to that community go in many directions. She's uh, worked for practically all Brazilian agencies that oversee and fund mathematical research, and for her services, the government awarded her with the Order of Scientific Merit. She's commander of that order a few years ago. Her, she's a leading researcher in uh, fluid dynamics equations, and in particular weak solutions of such equations, and works as well with low regularity flows and transition to turbulences. Today she will speak about fluids, walls, and vanishing viscosity. So please, you have the floor. So I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers, the scientific com committee, and especially the panel for the PDE session for the kind of invitation to give this talk here. It's a great honor to be CPE here. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about fluids, walls, and vanishing viscosity. Uh, whatever I talk, whenever I talk about my work, it's a joint work with uh, Milton Lopsfield, my main collaborator. And then there will be other collaborators in addition to him. Okay, um, I'd like to uh, start upon suggestion of uh, my father, uh, referring to uh, Feynman, who called, uh, who, who made the distinction between ideal flow and ideal fluids, in fact, and uh, viscous fluids or real fluids uh, as uh, the flow of uh, uh, dry water, ideal fluids, and the flow of uh, wet water. And basically to state that what I'm going to be talking about here today is the flow of slightly wet water, especially in the presence of boundaries. Okay, let's uh, start with the statement of the problem. So what we want to understand is the interaction of uh, incompressible small viscosity fluid flow with rigid boundaries, and we want to know how do we describe this. Okay, so let me introduce you to the main parameters of the problem. First one is viscosity, which will always be denoted by nu, and it's a parameterization of the resistance of the fluid to shear motion. Uh, viscosity is given by 1 over the Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number is calculated as capital U times capital L divided by mu, U is a typical velocity of the fluid, L is a length scale that we're interested in, and mu is the kinematic viscosity, and it's a ratio, it represent, represents a ratio between inertia and friction. Uh, it's a non-dimensional quantity, and it completely characterizes the flow. It's what allows uh, <coughs> um, wind tunnels, for instance. Okay. Whoops. Not working. Not working. Ah, okay. Uh, wait a second. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, so let me give you a visual image of what we're concerned with. Um, here we have uh, the uh, laminar flow past a cylinder. This is a picture from Van Dyke's beautiful album of, mo of fluid motion. And um, what we see is the laminar flow is this uh, flow where the, the uh, flow lines are roughly parallel. We see it is that as it meets the cylinder, uh, you, you see this uh, detachment of these flow lines from the, the wall of the cylinder and the formation of this turbulent wake with black flow and plenty of uh, complicated patterns emerging. Okay, so what we want to understand is how do we describe this? Whoops. Okay. All right. So let me start with the governing PDE. So viscous and compressible flow is described by the Never-Stokes equations, which are 
which were derived originally by Claude Louis Navier, which is the uh, bottom picture, and uh, George Stokes, uh, the top picture. So Navier derived this in 1822 from purely theoretical considerations, and Stokes derived this back in uh, 1845 in the, the uh, modern day form. Okay, so these comprise a system of three, uh, four equations with four unknowns. So the unknowns are the uh, components of the unknowns are the components of uh, velocity. Okay, uh, u1, u2, u3, the velocity of the fluid, and p is the scalar pressure. And uh, the first line here represents actually three equations. So the uh, left-hand side is the differential operator ddt plus the differential operator u dot grad uh, applied to each of the components of u, and the right-hand side is straightforward. Okay, so, and this is the uh, second Newton's law uh, and the right-hand side is the force in the fluid, okay? Divergence of U is zero is the incompressibility condition, and we supplement these equations by initial and boundary conditions. Okay. <clears throat> um, I wanted to... Okay. I would like to uh, uh, stress, to emphasize here that in the, in the Navier Stokes equations, the relevant term is the term nu Laplacian of u uh, for positive viscosity nu. Okay? So the inviscid case, nu equals zero, is, is uh, described by the Euler equations, which simply are the same set of equations except that you take away the nu Laplacian u term. Okay? And they were derived by Euler in 1757. It's interesting to note that they were the second set of partial differential equations ever written. Okay. Uh, the most distinctive feature of the, the distinction between viscosity and no viscosity is at the, it can be seen at the level of boundary conditions, which in the case of Navier-Stokes viscos positive viscosity, you take the, the full velocity vector to be zero at the boundary, and this is referred to as the no-slip boundary conditions, and it represents the fact that the fluid particles adhere to the boundary. These are the usual boundary conditions taken for Navier-Stokes. For Euler, one usually takes the velocity to be tinned into the boundary, and this is called the non-penetration boundary condition, and it expresses the fact that the fluid particles tend to slide along the boundary, uh, and that the fluid does not leave or enter the domain, the fluid domain. The, the mismatch between these two boundary conditions is at the heart of the difficulty of the vanishing viscosity problem. Okay. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Ludwig Prentl and boundary layer theory. This was sort of the first description between this distinction. Um, and it it's a correction to the inviscid uh, uh, theory that was relevant for flight back in the early times in the dawn of flight, uh, which is the turn of last century. Okay, so uh, it's uh, based on the uh, uh, observation that the behavior of a fluid of small viscosity may on account of boundary layer separation be completely different to that of a hypothetical fluid of no viscosity at all. Okay, and um, this was uh, a theory that was proposed by Prantl in uh, a, a talk that he delivered at the third ICM in 1904 in Heidelberg. Prantl was a young engineer at the time, so he was given a, a 10 minute slot. In this 10 minute slot, he proposed an asymptotic description of, of flow with small viscosity. Um, and laid the foundations for boundary layer theory. What was Prantl's theory? Okay, so Prantl suggested that flows with small viscosity should be mo modeled by two separate yet interacting parts. Please recall that at, uh, at the time, people would just take uh, the flow of, of air around an airfoil to be in viscid period. So he said, no, wait a second. Uh, far from the boundary, you, you can take the flow to be in viscid, but near the boundary, the viscous effects are especially important. He called this a transition layer, now known as a boundary layer, and he estimated the thickness as being order of square root of viscosity. Okay, so far from the uh, boundary layer, the flow can be modeled as effectively in viscid. Near the boundary, you have to take into account the flow, the, the effects of viscosity. Furthermore, uh, he derived a set of, uh, of equations, asymptotic equations, for what happens in the boundary layer, which are su supposed to be simpler than the full Navier Stokes equations. And um, this is based on the ansatz that the tangential velocity inside the boundary layer should be of order one, whereas the normal velocity should be of order square root of nu. So within the, uh, the boundary layer, you, you have present an intense shear, 
with the tangential velocity vanishing exactly at the boundary and matching it to something of order one at the edge of the boundary layer. Why? Because the, the Euler velocity is simply tangent to the boundary, whereas the Navier-Stokes velocity is actually zero on the boundary. Okay, so here we have a representation of this uh, shear, shear stress. Okay, what is boundary layer separation? Now this was one of the main um, in, uh, discoveries of, um, uh, in uh, Prantl's investigations, and I have here uh, a translation of, uh, of the 1904 paper. It was a seven and a half page paper corresponding to that 10 minute talk, in which he says the most important practical result of these investigations is that in certain cases the flow separates from the surface at a point entirely determined by external conditions, and a fluid layer which is set in rotation by the friction on the wall is thus forced into the free fluid and in accomplishing a complete transformation of the flow plays the same role as the Helmholtz uh, um, separation layers, now known as vortex sheets. Okay, um, when is Prantl's model valid? Well, almost never, actually. And this can be seen very clearly in this picture of, uh, of flow past an airfoil. So this is uh, an airfoil, an airplane wing which is actually stalling, it's stalled, so the airplane is falling. Nevertheless, we can see that below the airfoil, this is a, a transverse section of the airfoil, below the airfoil, the, the boundary layer is neatly attached to the boundary, and that's a region in which Prantl's model should work. Okay? Um, above the air, airfoil, what you see is the uh, flow lines detaching, separating from the, the airplane wing, and you see backflow. Okay, you see the, uh, the, the, the fluid moving around sort of uh, in, the, in the wrong direction, okay? Um, and again, a lot of complicated structures emerging, okay? So that's a region in which you have boundary layer separation and Prantl's model is no longer valid. Okay, so and what we've seen is that a feature of the small viscosity regime is this intense localized shear flow, and that can be quantified by an object called vorticity, which is the curl of the velocity. Okay, and I want to give you an example uh, to convince you that that is the case. So let's consider a two-dimensional flow. So now my velocity vector has only two components, and it depends on only two variables. And the vorticity vector in this case can, is, points always in the same direction, and therefore can be identified with a scalar quantity, which we also call omega, okay, which is given exactly by the uh, ddx of the second component minus ddy of the first component. Okay, so let's look at the following shear flow. It's explicitly given uh, by these expressions here, but it can be visualized uh, uh, <clears throat> through this picture. So what you have is a constant laminar velocity above a certain layer, another constant laminar velocity below a certain, the, the same layer, and a, a linear interpolation in between, and the, size, the thickness of the layer is, is size epsilon. So this is playing the role of my boundary layer, okay? The vorticity, if you compute it in this case, is given exactly by zero above, zero below, and B minus A over epsilon, the jump and tangential component of velocity, divided by epsilon. When you send epsilon to zero, okay, so we're mimicking here what happens uh, with the uh, uh, viscosity. The vorticity is converging to a Dirac delta supported exactly on this interface, y equals zero. Okay, and this interface is what we call a vortex sheet in this simple scenario. Let's talk about some lessons that we have learned from Prantl. Okay, so small viscosity in induces an intense shear near the boundary, um, which can be quantified by large vorticity. But a boundary layer separation can happen where the boundary layer detaches from the boundary. The boundary layer generated by the boundary then um, uh, contaminates the bulk of the flu fluid flow. And as viscosity vanishes, complicated vertical structures entrain the bulk of the fluid flow at, at best at the level of regularity of vortex sheets. Okay. okay so. I want to show you a, a, a little video, a couple, a few videos in fact, that some colleagues sent. So this is a video of a, an impulsively started disk. So this is two-dimensional flow. An impulsively started disk, it's initially at rest, and then there's this constant velocity which uh, 
uh, comes at it, okay, fluid flow coming at it at time t equals zero, and what you see are this formation of these vortices exactly at the boundary. So if you can show this again. So again, you see the boundary layer forming at the boundary, and you see these, uh, uh, the boundary layer starts detaching, this, these vortices roll up and uh, permeate, enter the, the bulk of the fluid flow. Uh, the yellow and the blue represent vorticities of, of different sides, okay, which is, a, again, a, a consequence of this uh, of viscosity not being uh, zero. Okay? So, okay. So uh, the, the previous video was sent to me, uh, kindly sent to me by uh, Marco San Martino and his group. And uh, now I will show you some videos generated uh, by uh, Mari Farge and Kai Schneider's group. So this is a wall-bounded 2D turbulence. Uh, what we see here is uh, fully developed turbulence interacting in a disk, interacting with the, the walls of the disk. And we'll see these complicated structures forming at the boundary. Um, and actually this coherent, coherent vortices forming inside. This is very viscous flow still, okay? Okay. Uh, if you look at what happens near the boundary, really near the, if you zoom in near the boundary, you see these, uh, these thin vort vorticity layers, basically, which are coming into the, f the fluid. Uh, these are basic asymptotic vortex sheets. Okay, again, this is a video generated by uh, Marie Farge and Kai Schneider and uh, Natasha Vanier. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, a different approach to the, uh, the vanish of viscosity problem came from Kato, uh, Tosio Kato. Uh, this is a mathematical approach, and so he is actually looking at vanish of viscosity, which is a mathematical idealization. Prenel's work is small viscosity yet positive. Kato was concerned about uh, the limit of nu going to zero. Okay, so he he here's the setup. Uh, you look at two or three dimensional flow, it doesn't matter, and recall that if U0 is, a, uh, U0 is an initial data, which is an L2, then you have Lorey Hopf weak solutions and you have global existence of these uh, weak solutions. And the question is, are they well approximated by the Euler solutions? So first I'd like to recall the, uh, the uh, basic energy estimate for the Never-Stokes equations, which states that the uh, energy at time t plus two, two times the viscosity times the dissipation, uh, the integral in time of the dissipation, uh, which is uh, the du represents first order derivatives of the velocity in L2 squared, this is bounded by the initial energy. What this means is that if, uh, if you take an initial data which doesn't depend on viscosity, then you get a family of solutions which is uniformly bounded in L2, in L infinity in time in L2, and therefore you can pass to some weak limit. And there's a question, the basic question is, is this weak limit going to be a solution of the Euler equations in some sense, okay, or do new phenomena emerge? Okay, so Kato proved the following theorem in 1984, and actually this is published in, the, in a uh, P PD seminar from UC Berkeley, so it's not published in a journal, but it's a fundamental result. And the theorem states that if you take a, a Lorey Hopfweig solution with initial data U0, and if you have a smooth C1 solution of the Euler equations, uh, then <clears throat> you will get convergence of the Navier-Stokes solutions to this Euler solution if and only if the dissipation converges to zero times viscosity uh, in a thin layer gamma C nu, which is a thin layer of size of thickness uh, order of nu near the boundary. Okay? All right. The pr Kato's proof is very much along the, the, the same spirit as uh, Prantl's work. So he introduces a boundary corrector, does energy estimates, and uh, uh, together with rigorous analysis. That's the main difference with Prantl's work. Okay, there's a different scaling which emerges, but uh, nobody really truly understands this. Uh, it could be just a, a technicality. But um, the, the, what I want to call attention to in this, uh, in this work is in uh, Kato's result is, the, is this basic assumption that the Euler solution be a smooth solution, okay? So Kato criterion states that the smooth solution of the Euler is a good approximation to never Stokes if and only if the dissipation uh, is vanishingly small near the boundary. So the dissipation is the red term. Okay, 
Uh, there's been a number of extensions and interpretations and, and numerical simulations testing Cotta's criterion, and so I'm, st I'm just uh, quoting here several people who have worked on this, um, but there are many more. Okay. The question that we want to ask is, uh, is it reasonable to expect smooth solutions of the Euler equations to be vanished in viscosity limits? Okay. This is a there's a related issue to this question, which is the weak strong uniqueness for the Euler equations. Okay, the, I want to emphasize that the vanishing viscosity problem is a very hard problem. So let me tell you a few situations in which we do understand. Uh, the linear regime is very well understood. For instance, the, uh, the limit of Stokes equations to Euler, circularly symmetric flows in two dimensions. Uh, the Ocene problem is another linear problem which is fairly well understood. Okay, the weakly nonlinear regime is also fairly well under understood, and this corresponds to parallel plane and parallel pipe problems, which are uh, nonlinear, but the coupling is, is uh, uh, rather weak. Okay? Um, the ca there, there's a few situations in which you have no boundary condition mismatch. In other words, if you start with an initial data for the Euler equations, whose velocity is initially zero at the boundary, uh, that that condition is conserved by the Euler equations. But basic that's basically steady flow. Okay, um, another situation is if you change the boundary condition from the uh, standard boundary condition, which is no slip, to the Navier boundary condition, that makes it possible to quantify vorticity production at the boundary, and it's also a situation which we understand fairly well. Okay, um, and a, a, a different situation, which is if you change the, the partial differential equation, this is a, a nonlinear equation still, but it's a different equation from Navier-Stokes, Okay, it's a, a model for a, a turbulence, actually, um, called the Euler alpha equations. And then again, we understand what happens at the boundary. Okay, you have a boundary layer forming, but you can actually pass to the limit from Euler alpha to alpha. Okay, so uh, the difficulty for the, for the Navier Stokes to Euler. Um, problem is that the nonlinearity enhances the vorticity production at the boundary in a way that we don't fully understand. The dissipation becomes too weak, vortical structures affect the bulk of the fluid flow, and you have a transition to a turbulent flow. Okay, so let me talk about vortex sheets. Uh, the question is, can weak solutions for the Euler equations account for this complicated interaction of the fluid flow in some sense? Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the vanish viscosity limit. So parental theory suggests that we should seek weak solutions at the level of vortex sheet regularity at best. Okay, um, I'm going to to place my discussion in two dimensions because it's more amenable to analysis because the Navier-Stokes and Euler equations are known to be globally well posed in two dimensions. So let me introduce some basic notation. Uh, U is U V. When I take the perp of U V, I mean minus V U. Grad perp is just minus D D Y D D X and the vorticity is going to be grad perp dotted with u. Okay, uh, vorticity is the key observable, therefore, in, in fluid dynamics. At the level of vorticity of, of Euler equations, we can take the curl of the velocity and obtain an evolution equation for vorticity. It's a, uh, an active scalar transport equation uh, for the scalar quantity vorticity. Um, and the boundary in this case is characteristic, so there is no need for a boundary condition which is different from what happens for the Navier-Stokes equations in which you don't have a, boundary, a local boundary condition for vorticity. And that's, again, another way of expressing the same difficulty again. The interaction with the boundary generates vorticity. And th this is not quantified by the partial differential equation. How do you recover velocity from vorticity? Well, in 2D, you have this elliptic system, divergence u is zero, curl u is omega, u is tangent to the boundary. Um, so since the divergence of u is zero, u is a grad perp of some stream function, psi, if you compute grad perp dotted with u, you get the Laplacian of psi. So you get Laplacian of psi equals omega. And um, <clears throat> this suggests that we should introduce the Biot-Savart law, where we take the grad perp of a very specific Laplacian, the Dirichlet Laplacian, with zero boundary conditions, uh, we take the inverse of that and we get an object called k omega, k sub omega of omega, and it's an integral operator given by an integral kernel k omega of xy. Okay, so this is just the Green's function for the Laplacian. In the special case of uh, the full plane, 
Uh, this, the kernel is given by z perp over 2 pi z squared. The velocity coincides with the Biot-Savart law in that case. So u at time t and, and point x in space is 1 over 2 pi integral of x minus y perp over x minus y squared omega of ty. It's a convolution kernel, convolution operator. Okay, what do I mean by vortex sheet regularity? The two-dimensional vortex sheet, what we've seen is a, a direct measure supported on a curve, and the curve is going to be the interface across which the tangential flow is discontinuous. So since we're doing PDE, um, we wanted to, to quantify this in terms of regularity. Our flow is, is expected to have locally finite kinetic energy, and <clears throat> the vorticity is supposed to be a bounded, a red, bounded radon measure. Um, and since the velocity is supposed to be at L2 loc, I want it to be at H minus 1 loc, the vorticity, which is one derivative uh, weaker. Okay, so this excludes in particular point, uh, point vortices, Dirac's, uh, at the vorticity, because they have infinite energy. Okay, let me introduce the weak velocity formulation. So this is simply a distributional <coughs> Uh, formulation for the Euler equations, you take a vector field which is C-infinity compactly supported, uh, you multiply your velocity equation, your Euler equation by this, your test vector field, place all the dangerous derivatives on the test vector field, um, and then you get uh, an integrate in, in space and time. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, the thing is, what we do here is we take a test vector field which is divergence free, okay, and then we can use this to recover the pressure, okay? So the pressure is not present in the weak vorticity formulation explicitly. Okay, so in 1991, Jean-Marc Delors, president at, uh, at this talk, proved the following theorem. If you have an initial velocity which is L2 loc, divergence free, tangent to the boundary, and whose, whose corresponding vorticity is a bounded measure with a distinguished sign, then there exists at least one weak solution of the Euler equations with that initial velocity. Okay, Delors discussed the full plane, he discussed a smooth bounded domain, and he discussed a smooth compact manifold without boundaries. Okay, the strategy of proof was compensated compactness along sequences of, pro of approximations. I'd like to discuss Delors' proof here, but actually I'm going to discuss the version given by Steve Chochet in 1995, based on, the, on a weak vorticity formulation. So this weak vorticity formulation is equivalent to the velocity formulation in the case of R2, of the fluid domain R2. Velocity is given by the Biot-Savart law. And uh, therefore, we can work at the level of the vorticity equation, which is the scalar transport equation. We again do the trick of multiplying by test function and integrating by parts. But the problem is that the, this term is uh, not defined at this level of regularity. It's not defined if the vorticity is a bounded measure intersect h minus 1. Okay, so we're going to rewrite the nonlinear term so that it is defined at this level of regularity, and the way to do this is to substitute the velocity by its Biot-Savart law, okay, in the nonlinear term, and symmetrize the kernel. So let me show you exactly how we do it. We take this, this term, which is bad, L2 times measure is not defined. We substitute the velocity by the, the Biot-Savart law, we exchange X, the roles of x and y and use the fact that the kernel is anti-symmetric, so you get a minus sign, and then you take half of one plus half of the other, and you call this an auxiliary uh, function, h, h uh, sub phi. Okay, so h sub phi is the difference of the gradient of, of the test function at point x and point y times x minus y perp over x minus y squared. Okay. So here it is, the weak vorticity formulation <coughs> in terms of H phi. And the, the relevant fact is that this is now well defined for if the vorticity is a bounded measure and in H minus 1. Okay. Uh, why is this true? Because the, this uh, auxiliary test function H phi is a bounded function um, in our, our four cross time. Basically, from this difference in the gradient of the test function, since it's arbitrarily smooth, you get an extra x minus y here. And so you have two x minus y's in the numerator, two in the denominator, and you get something which is globally bounded. Okay, it's continuous except on the diagonal, but there are no Dirac's in the vorticity because the vorticity is at h minus one and a bounded measures, and therefore you can actually define this term. 
Okay. Uh, the relevant thing here is that to, to write this definition, there is no sign condition. Okay. Key elements of the proof of Delors' result, therefore, are that uh, the H phi is bounded, as I just explained, that I don't know where I have to point. Uh, H phi is continuous except on the diagonal and vanishes at infinity. And then the, uh, the, the distinguished sign of the vorticity is uh, given but because the measures who are in BM plus intersect H minus one loc satisfy this, this uh, estimate here, which is a no concentration estimate. So the mass of the vorticity in a small ball of radius R is bounded by the H minus one loc norm of omega times log r to the minus one half. So when r goes to, to zero, this vanishes, okay? <clears throat> this avoids a direct masses forming uniformly. So these are the key aspects of the proof and what happens therefore is the uh, operator which takes vorticity into uh, h phi omega tensor omega is actually we start continuous in this space. Okay, uh, you can actually work out a similar proof to extend this to Vorticities whose singular part is a, has a distinguished sign plus something which is an L1 with any sign. Okay. Uh, I have a few remarks here. First, that the search for weak solutions with vortex sheet initial data follows the pioneering work of Dupern and Maida from 1987. There's related work following Dupern and Maida prior to the Lohr's work on energy concentration in 2D incompressible fluid dynamics, and then there are a number of people who worked on that. The distinguished sign condition is a hard barrier. It's not a technical issue. There are a number of numerical experiments which support this fact, okay? The only extension to, the, to allow change of sign in the singular part of vorticity is the mirror symmetric case which we did with uh, Zhou Ping Shin in 2002. Okay, and there's, and I'd also like to emphasize that there's very little qualitative information about the Delore weak solution. In particular, if your initial vorticity is actually direct supported on a curve, you don't even know whether at future times the, vortic the uh, support of the vorticity will be on a, 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 a set of which house dimension. Okay. Okay. Now let me, uh, let me talk about what happens when you include boundaries. So as I said, Delors' theorem is, is a local theorem, so existence is okay, he already did this. <clears throat> the boundary condition is only satisfied in the trace sense, and therefore it's decoupled from the fluid flow. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the issues that we want to discuss are how does vorticity interact with the boundary of omega, and to explore vortex dynamics in domains with boundary. In particular, what is the corresponding weak vorticity formulation in domains with boundary. Okay, so let me give you an, a, a taste of what, what, what are the difficulties. So in a bounded domain with K holes, not necessarily simply connected, uh, the uh, velocity is not recovered from the, the vorticity simply through the Biot-Savart law. You have to add a harmonic vector field, H, which is, uh, since you have a finite number of holes, it can be described by a basis. It's a linear combination of a basis of harmonic vector fields, one for each uh, uh, hole. <clears throat> and we, we fix the, uh, the basis by truly harmonic vector fields who are, uh, whose circulation is prescribed. It's a Dirac, it's a Kronecker delta on each uh, boundary, okay? So <clears throat> it's relatively recently that people actually looked at uh, Euler flows in, in domains with holes uh, from the point of view of vorticity. But what you can, you can prove is that if the velocity is L2 divergence free tangent to the boundary, the vorticity is a bounded measure, then the velocity can be described by the Biot-Savart law plus very specific uh, coefficients for the harmonic vector fields, alpha j plus integral of wj omega, where <coughs> gamma j are the, is the circulation around each boundary component and wj are harmonic measures. Okay, the, vort the weak vorticity formulation on a domain with, hole, with holes is now this mess here. Okay, so what you get is uh, the, the, the standard term d dt phi omega. This is the nonlinearity term where you have the bios of arc kernel. This is not well defined at the level that we want for vorticities which are measures and we're gonna to have to work around this. And these terms here come from the harmonic vector fields. This, this term here has the the circulation on the outer boundary and gamma j's are the circulation on each of the inner boundaries, 
Okay? And again, you have terms here which come from circulation, from the fact that you have topology. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> if you were simply connected, then you would only have the uh, uh, blue terms and <clears throat> therefore here is the, I think I skipped something. Yes, I did. Okay. So I said we had to work on this uh, term that's not well defined. What you do is the same trick. You symmetrize the kernel exchange X and Y <clears throat> and you take half of one plus half of the other and you call that H5. Okay. All right. So the weak vorticity formulation, I'll give you the weak vorticity formulation in the case of the simply connected domain. Here it is. Um, <clears throat> and the relevant theorem here is that the weak vorticity formulation is equivalent to the weak velocity formulation. Therefore, Delore proved the existence of a weak solution to the Euler equations, which satisfies this weak vorticity formulation. It also satisfies the weak vorticity formulation with the holes, but I just didn't decided not to write this. Okay, what's interesting here is that this contains explicitly the possibility of exchange of circulation and vorticity with the boundary through these two terms here, gamma of t and gamma of zero. Okay, um, <clears throat> now, I have a few observations here. Well, why am I saying this ex exchange is vorticity? Because circulation for a simply connected domain is the integral of the full vorticity. Okay, so I have a few remarks here. Smooth, for smooth solutions, the circulation is cons a conserved quantity of Euler flows, of ideal flows. That's called Kelvin circulation theorem. <clears throat> for weak vorticity formula, solutions, maybe not. When you have a simply connected domain without topology, uh, you can solve for omega and then solve for its circulation. In other words, these two are basically decoupled systems. You can, I mean, you can first solve for omega, find the vorticity, the weak vorticity, and then find the circulation. However, if you have holes, uh, you can't do this. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, and the key results for, for the equivalence are again that the H phi omega is bounded all the way up to the boundary. This is something that you need in the case with holes. Uh, that it's continuous except on the diagonal and it vanishes if either X or Y are on the boundary. Okay? And then in that case, the proof of equivalence is very similar to the proof of existence. Notice that the proof of, of equivalence is irrespective of sign condition. Okay. okay. Uh, I just said this. Okay. So another observation is that bounded measures is the critical regularity here. If the vorticity were to be L1, just slightly better than bounded measures, then you can find weak solutions that do conserve circulation. But level, at the level of vortex sheets, you do not know if circulation is conserved. Yeah. Okay. So weak vorticity, weak solutions of Euler's vanishing viscosity limits. We do not expect smoothness. We expect at best vortex sheet regularity. And so if we, um, okay, all right. <clears throat> so if we have a, a, a family of weak solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations and we take initial velocities which are bounded in L2, then I, as before we have a, a family of solutions of Navier-Stokes which are bounded at L infinity in time L2. So therefore we can pass to a subsequence and obtain a weak limit, capital U. Okay. And uh, thinking about this, we formulated the following criteria, which is a, a different criteria from Cato because now it does, no longer assumes that the limit flow is smooth. Okay. So suppose that U nu is now a family of solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations which converges weakly to some vector field capital U. Okay. Suppose that the vorticities are bounded in, in L1 loc and Locally, for each compactly contained set, you can find a constant such that the soup in viscosity, soup in time of the L1 norm inside that compact set is uniformly bounded. Suppose also that locally, the soup in viscosity and the integral in time times the soup in X inside the compact set K of the mass of vorticity inside a small ball Suppose that this t vanishes as, as, uh, visco as R goes to zero. Okay, so this is the non-concentration 
hypothesis. Hypothesis two is almost uh, redundant here. You can almost, it's almost a consequence of uh, hypothesis three except for the integral in time. Then you use a weak solution of the Euler equations. Okay, I, a few remarks here. First of all, these are strictly local conditions. This is a follow-up on prior work due to Peter Constant and Vlad Vickel from 2017. Okay, they did it, they worked, uh, they had a, a stronger condition which was namely that the, the vorticity was assumed to have a locally bounded L2 norm, okay. We interpret these conditions as L1 low vorticity plus no concentration of vorticity in the interior implies, uh, or no interior Dirac's implies that the Euler, the limit is a solution of the Euler equations. The proof is yet another instance of the delors chauchet proof. In other words, there's nothing new here in terms of proof. The only thing new is just an observation that it works also for never Stokes with no slip, okay? All right, and the, the last observation is that this criterion <coughs> allows vortex sheet regularity and worse, okay? I'd like to mention a few open problems that are left here. Uh, we would love to extend the criterion to allow for uh, domains with non-trivial topology. We can't do this at the moment. We'd love to extend Delors' result to allow vorticity with sign change, and that's a, a very hard problem, okay? And we would love to find all one local estimates for vorticity of the never Stokes equations. And uh, quite possibly, quite probably, in fact, problems number two and three are related, okay, are the same problem, okay? And of course, the main question that we started out with, are vanishing viscosity limits weak solutions of the Euler equations in any sense? Okay, and I'd like to give thanks to the organizers of the ICM, to all my collaborators and projects related to this talk, especially Milton Lopes Filho, my main collaborator, and uh, to Brian Mauricio Garzon Rodriguez, a student of ours who give, gave a lot of help with the images and videos in this talk. Um, to CNPQ, FAPES and FAPERS for partial support all these years, and to you. Thank you. Thank you, Helena, for the beautiful talk. Are there any questions, please? Yes, there is a question over there. Could you please, yeah. Ah. Uh, could you say more what you mean by um, vortex sheet regularity? Because vortex sheets can become, can become singular. I'm sorry? Could you say what you mean, could you say more about what you mean by vortex sheet singular, uh, regularity? Uh, what I mean by vortex sheet regularity is that the vorticity is about to measure an intersect H minus one. It could be something a lot worse in principle. Okay. Right. Huh? There. Yeah, that, that's what I mean by vortex sheet regularity. We have another question there. Yeah, so just to clarify, on the last slide you said you were thinking of extending the proof for non-distinguished sign. Uh, does that mean that you believe it should be true? Or what, what's, what's your, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that something like that should be true. I mean, that it, yes, I think you should be able to prove existence, but I have no idea how, beyond the mirror symmetric case. In fact, um, what we know is basically at any, in any situation in which you can uh, control the mass of the, you know, that you don't have point vortices in the limit, you can, you can prove uh, existence. We, we, have other, we have some numerical calculations which we did, which we can, we can uh, <coughs> justify that the limit is a big solution. Are there other questions, please? No, so let's thank Lenin again.